Hello again, Cape Cod. I'm Greg Anderson. If you think the race for president is fiery and unpredictable, take a look at the Senate race here in the Plymouth and Barnstable District. Senator Susan Moran is stepping aside from her Senate post to run unopposed for the Barnstable County Clerk of Courts job. That means her seat's up for grab. There are three people that are vying for that Senate seat, one Democrat and two Republicans. The two Republicans are facing off in the primary, Representative Matt Meritori and my guest, Carrie McRae of Bourne. Hello, Carrie. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for having me here today. This is exciting. Yeah, thank you. So tell me about Carrie McRae. You are known in Bourne, mm -hmm. but I live in Sandwich and perhaps in other parts of the district, we might not know you as well. Who are you? So um, again, Carrie McRae, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm an educator. I've lived on Cape Cod my whole life. Um, you know, as a young child, my parents moved from New Bedford, um, just like Ixaros actually, um, mm -hmm. from New Bedford to, uh, to Buzzards Bay. You know, my, my mother um, was an author. She passed away a few years ago. Ah, sorry um, to hear that. Thank you. Um, my father is, um, you know, in the military, was uh, a veteran of the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. um, as was my grandfather. So um, my dad also was, the, um, uh, was in the police department. And, you know, so I, I have always kind of um, looked at service as very important. And mm. my parents taught us that in our family that, you know, to serve is important. So um, I've been a teacher for about 10 plus years. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was in um, uh, the financial industry working in banking. And I've also had a couple of small businesses that I've run. So okay. um, Got a I've, full life. I have a full life. You know, I've done a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, and you're currently on the school committee. I am on the school in committee Bourne. in Bourne. I was actually just reelected, which was excellent. Um, it's really important to serve. And, and I, I think about with the children, that's really you know, who we need to focus on and make sure yeah. that our future generations are prepared. So this is the second time that you've run for the Senate seat. It is, it is. What did you learn, what are you, what are you applying lessons learned from the last time to this time? Oh, many, many lessons. Yeah. Um, you know, we, you know, I, I decided to run because you know, people were like, you need to do, do something, get out there, and you know, you've got fire in your belly, and let's not waste it. So. Yeah. I decided to run for state senate. I looked at the, the rep race and then remembered that Exaros is in my, he's my rep, and I'm like, oh, nope, he's, he's great. Yeah. So I decided to run for state senate, and I, I really didn't know much about the process of campaigning. But even at that, you know, we garnered 44% against the incumbent, you know, Sumeran, mm -hmm. Democrat, and, and I think I raised or spent about 25000 So. I looked at the numbers and I said, you know, there were 38,000 people that came out and said, we like her message, we like what she stands for. So when um, I decided right away that I was going to run again because it's important, and then we see that Sue decided to drop out, but I had already announced that I was running. And, um, so you were running against her? I was already running. Oh, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. And, and then when I saw that she dropped out, of course, I was, I was thrilled because I yeah. know an open seat is so much uh, easier to achieve, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've reviewed um, your, your campaign materials. I wanna touch on some of the issues, bridges. Yep. Um, one of the things that you had said was your, your challenger, Matt Mer Meritori, um, has really done nothing on the bridges in mm -hmm. the 10 years that he's been in the House. Can you expand on that? Tell me what your take is on his work as it relates to that, because if he wins, He's sitting in that in a driver's seat for a lot of issues that may support that. Yeah, or not. yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, do I think that it's so much that we have control as state senators and state reps? No, but we can put pressure. We can put pressure on our uh, governor. We can put pressure on you know Markey and and Keating and Warren, and you know. I look at it like um, the greasy wheel gets the grease, right? the squeaky wheel mm -hmm. gets the grease. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of how I look at things is that if we're not pushing and we're not you know, holding people who have the power to make those changes um, uh, responsible, then you know, where are we gonna go from there? So for me, I look at somebody like Rep Moratori who you know, he's more of a go along to get along. And, I'm not. I'm somebody who, yes, I, I will side with you and I will work with you, 
I will go across the aisle, like I look at um, Diana Zaglio, you know, state auditor. She wants to audit that legislator. I think that's amazing. Like, especially where, as a Democrat, she was there, and yeah. she's really pushing this. Yeah. So there's a reason why. So. Yeah willing to work with everybody. Are you pleased with the progress that we have right now on the bridges and what would you do to support or keep that pressure on? What specifically could you play a role in helping us get those darn bridges replaced? Well, I think the role is definitely to, uh, to make sure that we bring the communities together as well. So to have, you know, to be meeting with the, with the um, town representatives, to be meeting with the selectmen and saying, look, you know, we need to keep this pressure on so it doesn't just die out. Because we know every single year, you know, they're coming up with a new policy. They're coming up with new plans, they're coming up with new drafted ideas. We've already done all that. We now have our plan, which I think there's some things we still have to work with because I think there's too many people that are going to be cut out of their homes, forced out of their homes, and there's not enough attention given to that right now. Because of where they because live of in where and around they live. the bridges. Yes, on exactly, the um, immunal domain, yep. you know. Um, and, and I think that's something that we need to really look at, but we have to get new bridges. And I think the plan to do Sagamore first is smart. Um, it makes more sense. I mean, I've walked the bridge, I've seen underneath. It needs to be done now. So yeah. we have to just push, 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 push. Let's talk about immigration. Um, definitely something that speaks to the Republican uh, Party. In fact, you said you are uh, uh, an unapologetic Republican. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously immigration is, is a big deal. Yeah, and it um, speaks to the Democrats too. I mean, now yeah. we have Governor Healy who is finally standing up and saying, oh, wait, we might have a little bit of a problem here, right? Yeah. A little too late to the party, but um, this, is, this is across the board. And the, the, the majority are unenrolled in Massachusetts. Yeah. So, and a good chunk of them are conservatives. You know, and you know, for many different reasons, your, your job, your, you know, if you're part of a union, you're either Democrat enrolled or you're unenrolled, right? It's very tough to be Republican enrolled. So there are a lot of conservatives out there, a lot of people that are frustrated with what's going on. Why do you say it's tough to be <clears throat> a Republican enrolled? So um, enrolled as a, so as a teacher, yeah. part of MTA, NEA, so on and so forth, yeah, yeah. Um, they know what party you're in. They, they, they see that. It's, I, I've been out there canvassing for the MTA before, yeah. and I was like, Holy crap! I couldn't believe that. Yeah. So um, it's 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 tough to be somebody who stands up and speaks opposite, you know, the majority and and some of these factions of, of of society. And we see that in the unions, especially. So when we look at the the there's the Trump campaign and there's mm -hmm. you know the national picture, mm -hmm. there is a lot of that. You know, there's the discussion of rhetoric and and mm -hmm. name calling and the, yeah. the the pounding of the fist and uh, also, uh, even on both sides of the I was going to say on both sides, party. yeah. Yeah, you, you see that, but you also see on both sides people saying, let's tone this down a little bit. I agree. How does that apply? How does that influence your, your messaging and your presentation? Uh, because you are a Republican. Are you mm -hmm. a Trump supporter? I am a Trump supporter. So does that cast you in a certain light? Well, with some people, yes. Okay. And I think if people are like, oh my gosh, I will never vote for you because you support Trump. How could you support Trump? Um, what do you say to them? What I say to them is, he's my nominee. The American people spoke. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just Massachusetts. It's across the whole. And we, we see some of our Republican um, uh, nominees or, or potential nominees you know, running for Senate and all these other positions here in Massachusetts that are like, I'd never vote for Trump. I'm like, wait a minute, he's your nominee. You know, American people spoke. There were many to choose from, and he's the one that came out on top. And I don't think it's necessarily because of his, per his great personality. I think it's because he's strong, and he's, um, he's powerful, and he will sit there and say, these are issues, and we need to push back, and we need to fight them. I mean, the, the border security is huge, and we're seeing that trickle here in Massachusetts. And there are Democrat doors that I have knocked on. They're registered as Democrat, but they might have voted this way and this way, right? Because you could yeah. see all that data. Thank goodness it's not me. They just give it to me, yeah. um, you know, uh, coming up to that. But there are a number of Democrats that feel like, you know, we want to do humanitarian things. But I also see how this is impacting our seniors. 
I see how this is, I mean, you have people that are on Social Security right now that are getting so much far less than what the illegal immigrants are getting. That's insane. Mm. It, that, that, that's not common sense. Yeah. It's not. Do you, uh, do you see Republicans that are turned off by the, 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 the Trump presence? Oh, absolutely. And yep. are they on, how do, how do you appeal to them? Well, I think at the end of the day, it's you have to ask yourself, do you want um, more of your resources, more of your tax base to go to the citizens? Do you want more of your research, more of your tax base to go towards um, your schools, to go towards your um, you know, service, you know, services in your communities. Mm -hmm. Because right now, with um, you know, one party state pretty much is what we are, there's so much stuff that goes to things that, I don't know how to say it. Um, I think at the end of the day, we don't have to all agree on Trump. The majority of the country and the Republican base did and unenrolled too, mm -hmm. right? Conservatives. Um, but we just have to make sure that we put our citizens first and then we can approach those other things. So the governor signed in late July, signed, I think it's like a hundred billion dollar budget. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm sitting here on the Cape and I'm thinking, how much of that budget's come, dollars are coming my way? Mm -hmm. I would always be looking for an advocate to say, we need more down on the Cape. And so in your district with these eight towns, mm -hmm. um, what is your take on the budget and how much can you help us get funding for things here in those eight towns in your district? Well, it, it's funny because um, I've talked to a handful of legislators that are Republican and they say, you know, Carrie, the thing is when you get in here, you can't, pu you can't push back too much. You got to kind of just like lay it out because if you push back, they're not going to give that percentage of money to you for your district. So you got to kind of play the game. And I think the reason why it's like that is because we're not pushing back. We're not advocate, advocating for our citizens in our community. You look at somebody like Kippy Diggs, I don't remember exactly how much it was. It was crazy amount of money that he got back for his community, right? You see the same thing with uh, Dylan Finandis. Look how much money I brought back to my community. Uh, for one, that's all money that was taken that shouldn't have been, in my opinion. I think we need to reduce how much our taxes are coming out and let the towns manage those. It shouldn't just be that if you're a Democrat and you're a progressive liberal, like the Speaker of the House is, or, right, that well, we're going to give you more because of that. That's wrong because think about the, the base. If I, as, if I win and I, you know, we beat Matt Moratori and then I beat Dylan Fernandes, um, I'm going to fight to say, listen, this is how much you were willing to give if I was a Democrat. Well, this is my community and they picked me. They didn't pick him. Mm -hmm. So I know this game and you push back. And not just that, but we need to get more Republicans elected, whether they are moderates, whether, it doesn't matter. We just need people who are going to stand up and, and fight back, just like, you know, I mean, look at all these seats that are wide open, uncontested races. That, yeah. that's, that's wrong. That's not the way it should be. It's not yeah. the way it should be. Because we know these people have a voice. They speak. They're on social media. They're, they're standing at, uh, you know, out on the street, but they don't. They, but, but I also look at that as... Uh, some people must be a little concerned to put their name on a, on a street sign are. and say, oh my God, I don't want to have my butt kicked and, and, and be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how you differentiate yourself against Matt Miratori. You know, he, he, you, you two are uh, on September 3rd, you've got the primary election, mm -hmm. you're focused on that. Yep. Uh, some would say a person with longevity kind of understands Beacon Hill, hmm. how to play the game, how not to play the game, et cetera, is a good thing. Others will say, we need someone new and scrappy and going to come in there and kind of disrupt things. Mm -hmm. Where do you, I think I know where you land in that, but how do you um, speak to those people that say, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned about the scrappiness, I'm a little concerned about, uh, I want someone that knows the ways. 
Yeah. What do you say? So I, I, I think the issue with knowing the ways and, and being in there for 10 plus years is um, they already know how to work with him. They already know what to do. They already know, you know, people have said to me, you know, Carrie, we think that Matt has a better chance of winning against Dylan. And I'm like, well, why? Because they're both legislative. And, they're like, and I'm like, okay, um, who do you think is gonna fight more for you? They're like, well, you. And I'm like, okay, so, so what are we doing here? If we just keep electing people who are just gonna be, go along, get along, you know, that was one of the problems that I had, you know, with Matt originally in 22 was, you know, he made an ad promoting his two Democrat buddies saying, vote for the three of us. And they were two very viable Republican opponents to those two Democrat opponents. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I, is he part of the problem of why we don't have enough Republicans in office? Mm -hmm. Because if he's making a commercial saying, hey, these are the two Democrats, and you know we need to work together, and I, he even quotes um, why the Republicans always last in his little bit. That's the reason why, because you're not just working with them, you're promoting them and trying to keep them in their office. And then those, same, those two, one is now working with more Healy, and quickly endorsed Dylan Fernandes, and so didn't Kathy Lenatra, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what they do. So we need to learn that we need to fight, we need to push back, and the only way we're gonna have change in our politics or some level of balance is to have people who are scrappy, mm -hmm. who are gonna be respectful and are gonna work with everybody, but I'm not gonna just bend either because I yeah. want a seat on a certain committee. Uh, your social media presence, Facebook, yep. that's the word fiery came up when I was, yeah. uh, you know, the, talking about the opening of the, you know, the show. Um, it's, it's, uh, you've had enough. Yeah. This is, you know, a lot of words written in caps mm -hmm. and screaming and the, the exclamation points yep. and the, Matt is not doing it for you and you've had enough. Mm -hmm. um, is that too much? I don't think it's too much. I mean, who did, who did the United States of America choose as their Republican candidate? Again, Donald J. Trump. It's not because he's quiet. It's not because he doesn't want to get things done. And you know, we're at a pivotal moment, I feel like, in Massachusetts. You, you hear too many policies, too many things that they're taking away from the citizens, too many rights that they're infringing on. That's like socialism. That, that's not what we're supposed to be like in America. And in Massachusetts, you know, for years it would be like, oh, California's doing it, New York's doing it, now Massachusetts. Wait, Massachusetts is gonna do it. Now it's, oh, Massachusetts is doing it. Now New York's gonna do it, and now California's gonna do it. Mm -hmm. that's, that is a problem for me. I have six grandkids. Wow. Six. Six How grandchildren. Do you have, I don't know your age, I'm but I'm guessing 32. I'm 50. I'm 50. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have six grandkids. Yeah. And I really, I tear up sometimes thinking about what are we leaving them? I want them all to have opportunities to start their own businesses, not have to pay, pay $1,000 just for a business license. Well, you can go to New Hampshire and you pay 100 bucks. I mean, there are so many things that are in motion in Massachusetts that make it hard for people to buy a home, make it hard for people to start a business. It's every single day we're taxed and taxed and taxed and taxed, and Massachusetts is the worst for this. How do you, how do you prioritize, if, if you get the keys to that Senate office and yep. it's yours, what's your first six months of prioritization look like? Because you can't boil the ocean. You can't boil the ocean. Bringing like, the light to what's actually happening up there. Because if, if the citizens actually saw, and I've gone up to the State House, I've sat there and watched, it is horrific. They, they're so. so rude to each other. Like I see the senators, you know, you'll have one senator standing there talking, and he's a, I, I watched there was a Democrat, I can't remember what his name was, and he's speaking, formally speaking, and they're all just chit chatting. 38 of them, 39 of them, chit chatting, sidebars, back to the, to, to, they're speaking. Now maybe as a teacher, I just feel like if I'm speaking, right. you listen, right. and then 
we can debate and we can talk about this. They, they are so rude. There's like, there's no, there's no respect, yeah. even amongst their peers that they like. And I will change that. How will I change it? Because I'll put light on it. And yeah. I'll let the people know. You know, that's one thing that I really admire about Repix Aros is he, he's out there every day. He is not a part-time politician. He is out there every day. And he is standing there bringing light to what's happening. When they give him a bill at 2 in the morning and say, you're going to vote on this at 8, he lets people know, oh, yeah. I just got another bill at 2 in the morning, guys. Yeah. I'm going to do my best. That's the kind of stuff, I think, to let the people know what's really happening up there. Because a lot of people have no idea. We're working two, three jobs. There's not enough time to sit there and try to muddle through, which they make it very confusing on purpose, to find out exactly what they're doing. One thing I will do is raise my hand every time to make it a roll call vote. And in the Senate, you can do that. You raise your hand, you get one other guy. Ryan Fatman, Senator, come on, put your hand up those types of things so that people see what their elected officials are really doing. Yeah. Uh, the, the prioritization, shedding light, what do you show, again, those six months, what, you know, we're talking about Cape economy, we're talking about immigration, we're talking about taxes. Mm -hmm. Are there specific things that you want to, that you have your eyes set on outside of shedding light? Meaning, what would yep. you shed light on? What is it that you would focus on as a priority? Immigration. Immigration. First how, thing. How so? What would you do? Um, well, my, my Republican opponent voted against a, an amendment that would make it so that ICE could do their job in Boston. So if the police arrested somebody, pulled somebody, a traffic stop, whatever, not knocking on doors, but came across. Um, he voted against an amendment that um, made it so that we couldn't, con so the p law enforcement couldn't contact ICE and say, hey, we have a guy here. That, that's craziness to me, right? We need to let the people that are in those positions do their jobs. There's a reason why we have that. There, there's, we can only, I, I think about um, a life raft, right? You got a life raft, capsize, you're in a raft, it says 75 people, max. Doesn't mean exactly 75. You have some skinny people, some big people, right? But if you put 300 people on the life raft, everybody's gone. This is the problem. We have young people that are working families, 30 years old, 28 years old. They can't afford rent. Yeah. And they're working good jobs. However, we seem to muster up a billion dollars last year to pay for the housing for people that we don't even know if they're going to be able to stay here. They have not been granted amnesty yet. We have no idea. They, they come here with papers. We rubber stamp them at the border, throw them on a bus, send them to Massachusetts because we're a sanctuary state. Everybody's welcome here. I mean, there were billboards. Come on up to Massachusetts, okay? This is the problem. What we need to do is we need to get those people back. They need to go somewhere else. Not here. Not here. Not in our backyard. Not here. I've been following this for years. Texas, I have family in Texas, I have family in, in, in Florida. They've been dealing with this for years. People lost their minds when DeSantis yeah. threw them on a plane and dropped them in Nantucket, right? Yeah. They lost their minds. We even had the DA, I'm gonna sue and I'm gonna do it. What, are you serious? They've been do, dealing with this for years and we have been, oh, it's not happening here so it doesn't matter. Well now people are seeing that this is impacting them. Yeah. If you don't have enough money at the end of the week to buy the groceries you want because it's so bloody expensive, but yet you see other people here who are swiping a card and getting free food that you're paying for, but you can't afford your own. That is a problem. How do you fix it? How do you fix it? Yeah, like, like I said, I know, you, yeah. you let the people that are supposed to be doing this job do their job. But does that mean you change policy? Does it mean you need to you know, put a bill through, like, how does that happen? Well, I, I think, I think the first thing is, is to, you know, people say, oh, we need to uh, repeal the, the right to shelter. Well, no, we just need to, we need to hold it to what it is. Yeah. There's it's meant for emergency issues. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the residency for residents, what do you mean for residents? In Massachusetts, you walk across the border, 
You go to the post office, you go to the, the driver's license and you change it, now you're a resident. There's no, like you go to yeah. uh, North Carolina, it's like six months before you're a resident, right? Yeah. There's a process to it. Here, no, nope. hey, everybody come, you could be a resident. What do you mean? We don't have room for these people. We don't have room. It's a capacity issue. Mm -hmm. We have people that are living on the streets, who families, families who are working, living in their cars because they can't afford rent, even if they find a place. And then you have these projects that they want to put up, and they're like, oh, it's going to be 10% affordable, and then the balance of it is market value. Okay, fair market value, people can't afford it. Yeah. That's not going to solve it. So we live in a beautiful place, we have, uh, it, but, but people can't afford it, especially the younger generation. Yeah. There's no starter homes on Cape Cod. Nope. Uh, how do we address that housing price issue? How do you speak to that? Well, I think that some of these huge um, uh, property management companies and, and, and stuff, what, you know, there, there's something that we saw many, many years ago where it was like tiered. So you would show your paycheck and they'd say, okay, well, this percentage, whatever it is, is right. gonna be your rent. That's a great start. Maybe, maybe, here's a thought, instead of making them all apartments, why don't we make them condos? Because when people have a piece and they own something, I mean, I pay less for my mortgage a month than people are paying for rent. How are we gonna let them have the American dream if yeah. they're paying $3,000 for rent, they'll never get there. And so when you see these projects going up, um, you know, say in, uh, in uh, Falmouth, upwards of 900 units, why don't we make them condos? Yeah. Why don't we let people own a piece? There's, you, you have a, a sense of pride. You know? What about home, private homes, you know, yep. I individual homes? Those are, we can't afford it. You know, homes are going for over a million dollars yep. in neighborhoods where four years ago they were in the five hundred thousand dollar range. You know, well, how I do mean, we I think I think part of it is look what look what Maura Healy did, right? I know somebody personally who was actually staying in Yarmouth at that hotel. They got a note under the door that said, "Hey, going forward, as of this date, the room rate I think it was going up to a hundred dollars a night or whatever it was. I, mm -hmm. You know, the figures." It, it was like it was like 60% more than what it was before. The reason why it went up to that, the reason why the rents now $3,000, 3200 2800 is because Maury Healy said, hey, you know what? If you house these people in your hotels, we'll give you $100 a night per person. Totally screwed up. It, it totally messed up the, the amount of money they could charge. So then... Then when they they own look at the majority of people they own one rental you know and then they don't usually just own one or two they yeah. own tons of them so if the state is willing to give them this much for this they're like okay well you know what uh, I should be able to charge this much for this yeah. be able to charge this much that's the problem talk to me about uh, you know we're talking about issues that clearly resonate across all uh, all communities yep. But if you become our next state senator, you've got eight different communities, mm -hmm. you know, up to Kingston, Falma, all in yep. between. Each have their own unique issues. Some are beach replenishment, some are infrastructure, some are, you know, their schools. Mm -hmm. How do you convey your understanding of the issues in? For example, sandwich, mm -hmm. you know, our sandwich issues, because selfishly living in sandwich, I'm thinking whoever I vote for, I want to make sure that my sandwich issues are being heard on Beacon Hill. Mm -hmm. How, what's the process of truly understanding, you know, it's taking immigration, yep. yes, yep. but then there's beach replenishment of in course. sandwich, or there's schools in Kingston. How do you understand and then kind of prioritize your focus on those eight communities and their unique needs. So my plan is, you know, people people talk about, you know, this this job as a state senator is really a part time gig. There are a lot of people that are going to, you know, they they're lawyers or they're, you know, or they're teachers or they're other other professions, and you know, they 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 do it all. For me, my full time job will be this. This will be my full time job, and I will have um, hours scheduled, you know, very much. Uh, deliberate to meet with town administrators to meet with not just 
meet them because I want their endorsement, not just meet them, you know, when it's oh, election cycle in three months, but really to sit and say, what are the concerns? Because they know, your board of selectmen, they know. That's their job throughout the whole year. They're gathering all the information. Those are the people that you need to make sure that you're sitting down with, at least I would say, at least monthly, if not bi-weekly, even if it's just on a phone call, even if you can only sit there once a month in a, in a formal meeting. But to have that open communication so that you know that when you're up there on Beacon Hill and there are bills that are coming across, how is this going to impact Pembroke? How is this going to impact Plimpton? Is this going to benefit Sandwich and Falmouth? Right. You'll know because you're in those communities meeting with those leaders. In the Cape Cod, we're, we're, we're just out of, almost out of time, but I want to end on this. Um, you are, uh, in, the, in the Cape Cod Times, you had a series of questions. You and, and Matt Miratori had questions that you answered. I, I want to just f have you expand on, uh, expand mm -hmm. on, on one of them. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, if elected, how do, how do you plan to address the issues that you had raised in the top, yep. top three issues that was in the previous question? One of the things that you said was, people who know me say I'm a force of nature. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate, relentless, an independent thinker, and a leader unafraid to fight for the regular folks. I hope to represent, I've got a big voice and I'm not afraid to use it. Yeah. I'm sitting here, you know, two feet away from you. I can see the voice and mm -hmm. I can see the passion, but how do you, it, it, just tell me how that translates to why I should vote for you. Because if you're a Republican, you must be frustrated. You must be frustrated because you're like, I supported that candidate, or I really had high hopes for that candidate. Look at what they did. Are they forceful? Are they pushing back? Are they communicating with you or your community and saying, hey, this just came across and I'm really sorry, I tried to fight. The, the majority of them are not. Yeah. We need to do that. We need to advocate. Because let me tell you, on the other side, you know, you have your, your, your Democrats. Then you have your progressive liberal mm -hmm. Democrats. The progressive liberal Democrats are really who are running the show right now. There are moderate Democrats who I have great conversations with who say, you know, sometimes I just sit there like, oh, I don't agree with this. But we're in the same party, so I just kind of have to go along. And I say to them, no, you don't. You can push back, too. I push back on some Republicans. Mm -hmm. You know, I I've had phone conversations with some of the reps. Called them and said, what the heck were you thinking? Why'd you vote that way? Please explain this to me. Yeah. Sometimes I like their answer, and sometimes I'm frustrated, and I let them know that. That's, that's what I mean when I say I'm, I'm an independent thinker. I have a strong voice, but it's all for the betterment of our communities to put the citizens first, to put our veterans first, to put our, um, you know, our seniors, I mean, it's, it's horrible that we have seniors that have called me and said, I had one, uh, we don't have enough time, but they, they, they're not feeling like they're heard. Yeah. You know, they feel like they get heard bits and pieces during election season. Then they don't see anybody else. And, and that's not what I'm about. I will be present. Carrie McRae, I think I know where you're coming from. I think you're a little vague, but uh, I'm kidding. Excellent to talk to you. Um, I, I, I think it's, I love a contested race. Yep. I love a contested race. And, uh, and, and I think it's a, it, you know, clarity in where, where um, candidates are coming from is essential. And that's, yep. that's, that's what this whole discussion is about. So thank you for bringing clarity. Yep. Um, okay, my friends. So we have a primary election on September 3rd. You need to get out and vote. Um, you have two candidates to look at on the Republican mm -hmm. ticket. Um, this is one of them. And uh, I hope this has been helpful. And of course, don't forget the September, I'm sorry, the November 5th general election. And we'll see who on that Republican ticket. I'll see is. you there. All right. She says she'll <laughs> see you there. I'm Greg Anderson, and I'll see you next time.